Welcome to Travels with Tulsans, sponsored by the Friends of the Tulsa City County Libraries. My name is Marion Sexton, and I, we are so glad to have you join us for this seventh of our eight adventures. If you would like more information about becoming a friend of the Tulsa City County Libraries, please visit tulsalibrary.org slash friends. Be sure to join us next week as we wrap up our 2022 Travels with Tulsans with a great presentation of Italian 101 in 45 minutes. What you should know about Italian life but didn't know to ask by Pam Chu. The link you used for this week is good again for next week. If you don't have a link or lost yours, email friends at tulsalibrary.org to request one. Please feel free to share the link with your friends. Our travels presentations are being recorded. If you miss any or would like to see them again, look for them on the Tulsa Library YouTube page on YouTube. The first five are already posted. During the presentation, please feel free to put any questions you may have of Teresa in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Following her presentation, any questions you have will be addressed. Our traveler today, sharing the wildlife of Tanzania, is Teresa Minders Burkett. Teresa is a local healthcare attorney who enjoys outdoor travel to view wildlife in their natural habitats. Ms. Burkett is an active volunteer with the Nature Conservancy in Oklahoma and now is a member of their board and looks for travel opportunities where the Nature Conservancy performs much of their work. Please join me in welcoming Teresa Minders Burkett. Thanks, Marion. You're welcome. All right. Well, let's let's go to where it's warm down on the equator, heading to Tanzania. Um, first, I wanted to show you a map of the places we're going to visit. You can see here that um, Tanzania is in eastern Africa, just south of the equator. Kilimanjaro is up in the northeast part of the country and then North Ngorogoro Crater and Serengeti National Park are to the northwest of that. We fly into the Mount Kilimanjaro Airport to start this adventure. And here's a little bit more detail on the map. And I just wanted to welcome you to the Serengeti, although we're going to Arusha first. When we arrived in Mount Kilimanjaro, it was about 10 o'clock at night in a steady rain. And I had no idea what a beautiful place I would wake up to the next morning. We were on a coffee plantation that if you've ever been in that part of the world, the roads are, are a little bit messy. I'd say very muddy in the rain. And so traveling along and, and jiggling along the road and splashing in mud puddles is like, where in the heck are they taking us? And then we wake up to this um, beautiful plantation just outside of Arusha and very close to Arusha National Park. Arusha National Park also has a crater where if this was a photo that was all blown up, you'd be able to see a troop of baboons down at the very bottom. And we were greeted by every kind of monkey in the park as we drove through to look down into this, what they call a mini Ngorogoro crater, because it's a similar habitat, it's just a whole lot smaller. And it's very close to Arusha and, um, the plantation where we stayed. And that's where we met our guides with Natural Habitat Adventures. The next morning, we got on a flight to the Serengeti. And after experiencing the roads, I knew why this was a much easier option. But our guide told us to look out the window as we flew and to see the mountain over there on the horizon. And that was going to be kind of a waypoint we'd use in finding our way through the Serengeti, that we would always be looking uh, towards that mountain to know which way we were going. One thing about 
um, Tanzania is is home to many, many flamingos. And I didn't realize how limited flamingo habitat is. But they thrive on the brine shrimp. And we just saw hundreds of them and were able to enjoy a lunch there um, overlooking the lake where the flamingos were having their lunch too. We'd been told on the way into the Serengeti that we should stay in our tents unless we were with a guide. And that once we were walked to our tent at night to stay there, and if we needed to leave for any reason to flick the light or to call with a little radio in our tent to the um, guides, but to not for any reason get out of that tent. And when we were ready for breakfast in the morning, the guides would come and gather us. And I was like, well, that's kind of strange. What's the deal with that? We're adults. Well, these guys were lurking outside the tents and were along the trails between our tents. And when we were lying in bed at night, we could hear the hyenas huffing. And I quickly learned that we we wanted to be with a guy and we weren't going to get outside. But those were the scariest things, truly. All the rest of the life, wildlife was seemingly docile. We saw so many lion families and they climb up on these rocks called kopjis that look out over the Serengeti and they are looking for wildlife, looking for other lions, but the entire day they seem to spend time up on these kopjis. And the word Serengeti means endless plain. And it looked to me, being an Oklahoma girl, it seemed very much like the tall grass prairie preserve here in Oklahoma. Just grasses as far as you could see. But then suddenly there'd be a lion or a giraffe on the horizon. It's like, ah, we're not in Oklahoma anymore. But the landscape looks really surprisingly similar. It's the wildlife that truly sets it apart. And of course, the distances. The cheetahs hang out on kopjis too. They pick different ones. They're not exactly friendly with the lions, they're competitors. And this is a mama cheetah who had four or five cubs. And a good part of our time with this cheetah, we were able to watch her um, teach the cubs how to chase down a gazelle. And then she let them eat first and it was very obvious which baby was the alpha because certain ones would get to eat first and then the kind of the runt of the litter had to eat last. But mom ain't last of all. She made sure all of her babies were well fed. And here they are after enjoying their lunch. Sadly, we had to stay in the vehicle. We couldn't lie out on the warm rocks with them, but what a beautiful family. I had no idea how rare it was to see a leopard until our guides got really excited when they had a real quick conversation with another guide who came up in a different vehicle and they pointed excitedly to a place and our guide said, okay, I think we're going to have something you're really going to like, but they didn't want to get our expectations up too high. And we came around under one of these trees and there was this leopard and what a what a beautiful creature the leopards catch their prey out on the plains and then they are such strong animals they drag their uh, catch up into the tree with them to protect it from other predators because I'll tell you what those hyenas will get on anything if a bigger cat doesn't uh, take care to protect it or eat it first um Let's see. When we were in Tanzania, it was for the Great Migration, where the wildebeest rotate through the Serengeti following the rains. Look at that thunderhead. If that doesn't look like an Oklahoma thunderstorm getting ready to happen, I don't know what does. 
but the wildebeest travel with zebras. This happened to be a herd of just the wildebeest, but there periodically would be zebras sprinkled in with them too. And we situated our vehicle in the middle of the stream of wildebeest. And standing there in the middle of the Serengeti, we saw millions of wildebeest coming towards us. Then they divided as they reached our truck and then went around us and they just kept going as far as we could see. Wildebeest in a stream, as far as the eye could reach from horizon to horizon, literally millions of them. I think that was the amazing thing that caused NADHAP to set the uh, tour when they did, because it was right in the middle of this migration that you only get once a year. Here's the mama cheetah teaching her cubs how to eat. And that guy right there on the right is the biggest one. And he seemed to get the lion's share, uh, wait, cheetah share at the lunch. I was happy that we came upon the kill. I had been prepared. I know it's nature. I was prepared to see an animal die. We didn't have to see anything die. We we saw the remains, but the, the, um, the cheetahs were so considerate to take care of it before we arrived and then let us watch the babies eat. Lo and behold, if we didn't find another leopard, this is a leopard who has a den up on top of this. It seems bigger than a typical kopchi. This was high up in the air. And this was near sunset where she came out after being in her den most of the day, probably looking around to see if she could find uh, anything to go catch for dinner for her and her cubs. Uh, but once we realized how truly incredibly rare it is to find a leopard, we were especially excited to find this one. There were also a lot of babies out and about, not just cheetah babies, but um, this is the time of year that they all have their young. And this was a baby giraffe that was just a few days old. Um, it, it, it was just astounding to me that we'd drive along and we saw so many giraffes that it's kind of like, oh, another giraffe. Because of course, the first one you see, you're so excited, but we were just seeing giraffes throughout the Serengeti anytime we were in the trees, because of course that's what they like to eat. As I mentioned, the zebras travel along with the wildebeest, and when they're not running on the migration, they're stopping and grazing. And while they rest, this is a typical way for the zebras to stop. They put their heads on one another's backs so they can have a 360 view of everything around them. And then they swish the flies from their partner's face. As you can see in this photo, the zebra on the right doesn't have a tail. And we figure it was probably nipped off by a lion, but um, he's lucky to tell the tale anyway. But zebra were so plentiful and they just follow along with the wildebeest. And I think one idea of them all going in such a huge herd is when the predators come at night, because most of the predators are nocturnal, they're in such a big group that somebody's going to become the prey. But in a big group, they're far less likely to be the one picked. If somebody gets separated from the herd or is um, injured or maybe too old to keep up, they're the most vulnerable. But even while they're resting, they're watching. Because even though the lions and leopards and cheetahs and, uh, see, I think I'd hit some off. They're all nocturnal. Uh, some of them are out there in the daytime too. After we left Serengeti, we turned back to the Southeast, back towards Arusha and went into Ngorogoro Crater. I had read for years about this place as being almost an Eden, filled with every kind of wildlife, all protected. And we just found so many interesting animals, but the views from the top of the crater rim 
were just incredible. It seemed like elephants were one of the most common creatures here in the Ngorogoro crater. And this is an old fella that we stopped and watched a while. One nice thing about going with a small group of people is if we had folks interested in any particular animal, once we found them, we could just sit there all day. You have to be pretty into this stuff because I'll tell you, like watching the cheetahs, you're there about eight hours watching the cheetahs eat. Uh, bring a book if you don't want to watch a lot of wildlife. But this um, older elephant was somebody we watched a while because somebody in the truck really, really likes elephants. So we, we hung out with the elephants quite a bit. This is a black rhino. And as you probably know, they're highly endangered. And our guides had prepared us that there's only a few of them here in the crater. You may or may not see it. And we got lucky as we were driving in here, here was the black rhino. And then throughout our time in the crater, we saw several more. But that was such a thrill to see one of these fellows. And it's definitely not just about the animals. I'd been told by quite a few people that if you're interested in birds, you're just going to be over the moon. And we were. This is an African crowned crane which is such a showy bird. But we also had the giant secretary birds. And then of course, everyone's favorite giant bird, ostriches, look at that. They would get out and dance, just dance across the horizon. And I don't know if that was mating behavior. I suspect it was, but um, again, I felt like I was at the tall grass prairie preserve a little overgrazed, it's not exactly tall grass, but just the endless plains only with ostriches. Really enjoyed watching them. And then again, the babies, we were coming to a place for our picnic lunch and stopped at a little outhouse area and our guide saw a puddle of blood. And we thought, uh-oh, somebody died here. And he said, no, somebody was born here. And he said, there's a new baby here, very close. He said, let's have our, our lunch and then we'll go look for it. And of course, these are experienced guides. They found us the baby. This is a little elephant who they think was probably just three hours old. And he hung out with all of the matriarchs of the herd. They were very, very protective. We got to watch him uh, figure out how to nurse. But um, watching this new baby with his family, and then as they all sauntered off together, the baby in the center of them and all the aunties and mom surrounding him, it, it was just a great experience. And then after... We left the crater, which if I'd been allowed to have more photos, <laughs> the orangutans at the exit, oh my gosh, they would steal anything. And uh, and I wait a minute, now I say orangutan. They might have been baboons. Good heavens, I should get my continents and animals straight. But um, the baboons were everywhere. And if you had the window open, they would reach in and take whatever you had. So we, we sat there waiting to do the final paperwork, watching all the baboons surrounding the cars for something good. But when you're traveling in the Serengeti or Ngorogoro, you have an opportunity to stay at some of these beautiful, beautiful plantations. And these grounds were gorgeous. And that's the little... Uh, private casita we had for our trip. And right the night before we flew out, we were back on the grounds of the coffee plantation where we started and they had Appaloosa horses. And I just thought this was such an incredible view of all the green with domesticated animals, not the wildlife of the Serengeti, but just the surrounding of green with uh, the animals to say goodbye. 
And that is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? We do have a few questions. Um, Vlad wanted to know, wait a minute, where is her? Wait a minute, I lost her, her question. Oh, what time of year were you there? We were there in January, the last two weeks of January, and we flew back to the U.S. at the beginning of February 2020, and we were just mystified because we'd heard when we left the United States that there was something happening over in China. <laughs> we figured it would just be another thing like the SARS um, outbreak from a few years ago. Uh -huh. And when we got back and flew to um, Amsterdam, they asked, of course, where you've been. And we said, uh, Tanzania. And then they say, well, have you been in China? And we we're like, what? Don't you know that the intensity is in Africa? No, we haven't been anywhere near China. And as everybody we ran into in the industry says, have you been in China? We knew something was up, but this was the beginning of COVID when we were there. We got so fortunate when we traveled. But the migration is in January through February and the animals will continue their clockwise migration and head up back to Kenya. And these wildebeest we were watching running across a prairie are going to ford a river. And many people go later in the year, and I say later, not summer, but more like April, I think, to see the wildebeest continue their migration back into Kenya and cross that river where there's crocodiles. I personally do not need to see that because apparently it's pretty active, but... Uh. We were here in January. Okay, and how long were you on? Um, about two weeks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was curious when you were saying that you had to, that so frequently you might sit in for hours to watch certain animals. How many people were in your uh, vehicle? Well, and I swear I am not a pitch person for natural habitat adventures, but they do small group tours and there were just six of us with a guy. Oh. So just six people and they own their own camps that other guides might have another group with them. But our camps were always about 12 people, but we were with the same group of six the whole time. And um, it was very muddy because it's kind of the rainy season and we'd go off across the Serengeti and hear this practical Oklahoma girls like, don't go there, you're gonna get stuck. And we got stuck so many times that we'd have to call back to camp and have the other guide come and drag us out. And one time we were watching a lion under a tree that we had been watching a long time. And we saw some angry elephants headed kind of across the river towards us. And the guide said, eh, it's probably time for us to get out of here. And we were stuck. And so oh, no. members of the group were assigned to watch the lion and the elephants while the guides got out of the truck with shovels and dug us out. And it's like, okay, I'll watch them. But what are we supposed to do if the elephants charge and the lion leaves? No one told us what to do. They just said to watch them. So we did. <laughs> But we experienced a lot of digging out of mud puddles because we'd sat so long, I guess we sank. But we certainly got more time than expected with that lion and those two bull elephants. <laughs> and did they stay put? <laughs> well, I think they were kind of interested in the huffing and puffing and flying mud. <laughs> they, they just watched. They kept an eye on us. We kept an eye on them, but they didn't advance. And I was grateful because I don't know what we would have done. Really? Wow. Laura wanted to know more about the zebras migrating. She wanted to know how far, like how far all in the park, when, that kind of thing. Well, when we were there in January, they were following the great migration path that the wildebeest use. So they were coming all the way from Kenya, where they had been for Christmas. And they were coming down in January through February into the southern part of the Serengeti, and then they take their northern turn and head back up to Kenya. And the zebras are right there with the wildebeest. They're they're just running right along beside them. 
Wow. I sort of think the zebra may stick around there. Some do. I don't think the wildebeest do, but I am certainly no expert on African wildlife after one trip. But I kind of got the impression that the zebras were more present all the time. And this was when the wildebeest were coming through, but there were a lot of zebras traveling with them. And they're all having babies at this time of year. And that was part of the challenge for the herd is everybody's dropping babies and all the lions and cheetahs and hyenas are waiting. But we didn't think that. Can you imagine having to walk and walk and walk when you're having a baby? <gasps> oh, and speak of walk and walk and walk, I love to walk, especially out across the prairie. And I asked our guide to let me get out and walk. And he says, um, I could lose my job over that. And by the third day, I was just dying. Could I walk? Because I'm not used to sitting in a vehicle all day. And that's what this is for. So this is a great trip for older people in the sense that if you're not very mobile, you just sit in a, in a vehicle, open air and watch all day. But he says, OK, we'll go down this road and I'm going to check all the grass around us and then we'll back up and then we'll follow you and I will walk with you. And I got to walk about 100 yards. We get back in the truck and we've gone about a half mile. And my travel partner says, look, there's a lion in 18 inches of grass because they lie down in there. And she just saw the tail flicker. And when we stopped the vehicle, a giant lion stood up. And the guide said, this is why I couldn't let you get out and walk. Oh <laughs> I didn't ask gosh. him this. <laughs> he was probably grateful for that. Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah. It was that. Pretty good for me, him, or the animal if something happened. And I, <laughs> in respect of that, no more asking for a walk. <laughs> Jennifer says, fabulous presentation, Teresa. The baby elephant made my day. Oh, and, and Jane I, wanted to know how close you were to the baby elephant. Oh, well, we were pretty darn close. Now, I know how to use a zoom on my camera. So it looked like I was maybe 10 yards away. I was more like 30 yards away, but that's pretty darn close. It and is. one thing about using a reputable company it is their ethic to never interfere with the animals, never cause them stress. So they are trained. They know where to stop and we don't get too close. We took the phone or the phone number, the license tag of a vehicle from a different um, kind of rogue guy who was just driving people in for the day who got so close to the cheetahs, he scared them off and they missed part of their meal. Oh. So the idea is to stay back a ways, but to get as respectfully close as you can. But the baby elephant, we were, we could hear it and we could hear their, their, you know, breathing sounds and yeah. That's cool. I, so you really need to have a good camera with a good zoom. A phone, no. a phone isn't going to work very well. No, it did. Yeah. I bought this. Let's see how you, but there you are. It's an iPhone with the three little cameras in it. And I bought it just for this trip because I didn't want to carry too much. Since you're flying to avoid all mm -hmm. the roads, you are very limited on how much gear you can take. And so I, I didn't have internet connection <laughs> that I could use the camera. And the iPhone worked perfect. Oh, that's nice. That's great. Um, Laura was asking, do other animals migrate there as well? I don't know about that. It seems like a lot of them live there. The flamingos migrate, and the great migration is the wildebeest and the zebra. There's gazelles with them and topi, all different kinds of hoofed creatures. But I think they live there kind of like the giraffes lived there, and when I say there, where we were, and there were hippopotamus in the rivers, that was one thing that was a bit of an uh, interesting experience. We would get up early in the morning and go out on the Serengeti, but we had to cross a river, and the guide would get out and make sure there were no crocodiles or um, hippos that might cause us risk. <laughs> 
And I'm like, yeah, they're walking. Anyway, then we'd cross the river after he made sure it was clear and we'd stay out all day looking at animals and we'd come back around sunset and go through the same process. And if it was too likely the vehicle could tip over in the river, we had to get out and walk with the guide. And he walked ahead to be sure there were no alligators or hippos. Once again, we were not trained in what to do if there were. <laughs> but we would follow him and step on rocks and mud flats and stuff to get across the river. And then the other guide would plow with the truck right across the river, almost tip over, and then pick us up on the other edge. So oh my it, gosh. it is a wild part of the world. And the roads are bad. <laughs> and there's animals, which is the point. Well, it sounds like the water wasn't very deep then. No, when you were crossing. no. Okay. There were pools and there were places where the hippos can hide pretty well underwater. And those alligators aren't that tall. They, they no. flat in the water because we saw them, but they weren't where we were crossing. And I think the camp was set up where there was kind of a natural ford. But there had been so much rain that it was just rutted and there was not a path out of the water to get across the river. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, Peggy says, I hear the, can hear the enthusiasm in your voice. Do you have plans for a return trip or a trip somewhere similar? Well, I was told by all of my friends who have visited Africa, how much they love it. And it's going to bite you and you're going to be there and you're going to want to go back and get it again. And I'm like, oh no, I have the rest of the world I need to see. But uh, yeah, I'm planning a trip to Botswana, Namibia and the Okan. Okay, I can't ever pronounce them until I go there. Okanvago Delta. And yeah, that's a different part of Africa. But And then another friend, my travel buddy who did this one with me, she is going to South Africa. And so now I'm like, huh, that sounds good. But my next big trip is to go with the Nature Conservancy in two weeks up to Nebraska to see the migrating Sandhill cranes. And then I'm going to Costa Rica with another girlfriend to go to the Oso Peninsula where Corcovado National Park is located. And there's only two travel companies that go there and it's the most isolated primitive part of Costa Rica. This is not a beach trip. So that's coming up. But, and oh wow. my goodness, Galapagos. We did that for Thanksgiving. And if that wasn't a treat, that is an Eden. And if you want to travel with a Tulsa presentation on the Galapagos. I've got a Zen sea lion to show you. A Zen sea lion. He sits in the beach with the waves coming up, looking into the sun. <laughs> He's my inspiration on a busy day. <laughs> oh, I would love for you to share those. And and you don't need to limit yourself to 20 pictures. You could have 200 if you wanted to. No, maybe not that many, but you can have lots. <laughs> well, if people enjoyed this one, I've I've got another show for you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, maybe next year. Yeah. We do this just once a year, but we would love to have you do another one. That's wonderful. Several Go people have said fascinating. You me away. <laughs> Your pictures yeah. are gorgeous. Thank you for sharing. Um, oh uh, all on a little phone. <laughs> that's amazing. After about the migration again, do the big cats follow the zebras, etc.? Oh, yes, the big cats are on the move with them, and I don't know that the big cats go very far with them because they're so territorial. Each cheetah, mm -hmm. each lion, all the leopards, they each have their territory. That they'd be in big trouble with the other uh, gangs if they moved into gang territory. So, but they are watching that migration they're following. And it seems like, especially the cheetahs and hyenas are hanging out waiting for a baby to drop. The lions, the leopards want the big ones. The cheetahs and the um, hyenas are just happy with the baby. Hmm. Yeah. There's uh, a lot. Yeah, I would. I yeah. wouldn't want to watch that happen either. No, and I, I was I was grateful I did not have to see it because I know it's nature. I get that, but yeah, it been heartbreaking. There's a lot of things that are part of nature that we don't need to see. Yeah. <laughs> 
I watched a big um, owl snag a, a migrating mama bat. And I knew that mama bat's baby was going to go hungry that night. And that has scarred me for years. Yeah, I'm not good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about, um, well, two things. One, the, did the places that you stayed, you weren't in the plantation house itself. You were in tents. Oh, the uh, lovely plantations are in the villages close to the airport. <laughs> the tents are on the Serengeti and in the Gorogo Crater. So we had both styles of accommodations, but there are no lodges or permanent buildings in the Serengeti or the crater. These oh. are tent cities that the outfitters and i say cities they were probably uh, 12 tents and a big meal tent that they pick up and move site to site probably once or twice a season because they how don't big is it it. how big are the tents and and what about facilities well um i i'm a tent sleeper so mind you i would have been very happy in a tent my tent is, is as comfortable as the four seasons but these were even nicer than my tent this is a platform tent with a wood floor with oriental rugs uh furniture a chandelier at the top with a canvas <laughs> wall in the center so there were two double beds a sofa lamps and then on the other side of the canvas wall was a shower and the bathroom and sinks with all bottled water and there are talking hours have you ever had a talking shower no <laughs> At dinner you tell the the uh, servers what time you would like your shower and they boil the water and come at the appointed time you've told them and you are in the shower and they're outside the tent and they pour it into a tank over the tent. And of course, by that time, it's cooled off enough for you to have a warm shower that you say, okay, I'm ready. And they talk to you and say, okay, here comes oh. the water on the other side of the tent, which is a little unnerving for a lady to hear a strange man's voice next to her in the shower. But then you get your shower and when you're finished, you say, okay, I, I'm rinsed off now and they then take their buckets and go away Gosh. <laughs> yeah that would be a little unnerving hearing a man talking to you from yes yeah. and uh, i'm nervous he was nervous because the hyenas are out there with him oh and, you know, he had a lot more to be nervous about than i did <laughs> yes wow uh diane says we need to hear about costa rica next season I think you do. I'm going in yeah. January. No, oh, that'll be That's well. Then it may have to wait till the next year. So we may have to have something else next January, January and February. Well, we might have that by then. I want to show off that Galapagos trip because I always had heard how great it would be. I was not prepared for how great it was. Oh, I would love to see your Galapagos. Okay, that is next year. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh. Will the cats eat a baby elephant? I think, okay, think about this. And I learned this on, with once again, everything in Serengeti, you can see at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, not that I'm making a plug for this, but <laughs> the reason the coyotes would never eat a baby bison is because the mamas are dangerous and the coyotes want to live another day. Same for the big cats on the Serengeti with the baby elephant. That baby elephant was protected by at least 15 giant angry beasts if you got too close. And no predator can risk having a broken leg or a broken back or anything else. They won't get close to a baby elephant because those mamas could kill the predator. They can more easily get a wildebeest because there's a pack of the cats and the wildebeest are not that big. They have to try to avoid being kicked, but the, the order of magnitude and size, those giant elephants are not gonna let anybody get that baby. That mom was pregnant almost two years. Are you kidding me? Really? No kidding. And that, and that baby was big. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine having that big of a baby? No. 
<laughs> I saw the blood. <laughs> I'm curious about the nature conservancy. And I mean, this sounds really interesting. Well, the Nature Conservancy has been around for about 60 years, I'd say. It was founded in Virginia, and the Oklahoma chapter opened in 1986 to open the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, which was the first large acreage preserve that the Nature Conservancy had done. In the Northeast, they've been doing like five and 10 acre tracks, and they're like, eh. To save an ecosystem, to save species, you can't do it five acres at a time. So they've got 35,000 acres up there uh, just north of Pahaska. And that was their first. They're now worldwide. But an exciting piece of news that folks are going to be hearing about is we've got a new preserve of 12,500 acres that will be open and part of the Nature Conservancy's properties in Oklahoma, just east of Tulsa. And it's going to be the same habitat as the Keystone Ancient Forest. And in fact, the science is showing us that there's probably some of those ancient trees there too. So be watching for that news from the Nature Conservancy, because right now the closest preserves are either the Nickel Preserve over on the Illinois River or the Tallgrass Prairie. And those are both over an hour away. This will be something within 30 minutes. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That'll be really interesting. So does the Nature Conservancy have the money to buy all these, to buy these huge tracks? Oh, and, and it's all almost like I paid you to set this question up. <laughs> They don't <laughs> buy most of their properties that some of the preserves they do own in what lawyers, yeah, you got a lawyer here, Paul, be simple, absolute. They have title to the property, but much of the land that they protect, they take a conservation easement on. And a conservation easement is excellent and is what the Nature Conservancy and Land Legacy are using to protect Tulsa's water supply because yeah. they bought easements along Spavanaugh Creek in Lake Yuki. And that means the land can stay in property owners' hands to be used as a ranch or a home or whatever it's always been used for, but they can't develop it. They can't put a chicken house on it, but it stays yeah. in private hands. And so the county is still getting the property taxes from it, but because there's a conservation easement on it, is protected and it has a lower tax value. So the family benefits by having lower property taxes. And if they donated the easement, they get a income tax deduction, but the city of Tulsa actually purchased the easements along our water supply. And they did that to get money into the hands of the local people protect the land and encourage them to do it, but keep the land on the county tax rolls so the counties weren't mad at the city. So the city of Tulsa's Tulsa Metropolitan Utility Authority provided the funding to buy the easements that are held by the Nature Conservancy or Land Legacy, another uh, land trust here in Tulsa. Really interesting. I mean, I knew that Lake Uchi and, and Spavanaugh were Tulsa's water supply, but I didn't know all that. That's really well. They were threatened by the burgeoning uh, chicken houses, and yeah. now by the burgeoning marijuana facilities, growing facilities, and so everything along our water supply is protected, can't be befouled, and that keeps our rates lower because we don't have to pay more to clean the water before we drink it, and it mm -hmm. also helps Tulsa with its economic development efforts by having plenty of clean, inexpensive water for new families, new businesses. So the well, nature I've always, is doing a lot. I've always been so grateful for our good water in Tulsa. Yes, ma'am. Well, all pe everyone is singing your praises here. And uh, Joyce says, great job, Teresa. I learned lots and enjoyed along with my cup of soup on a wintry day. <laughs> and I'm once so again... Glad. Once again, I'm glad that we were doing this on Zoom this year, so we didn't have to worry about trying to get to the library today. And the yep. library closed a few minutes ago, so we wouldn't have been able to anyway. So this is great. 
And I'm so glad that all of you have come and joined us today. And Teresa, I can't wait to hear about Galapagos next year. I can't wait to tell you about it. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Uh, we'll see you all later. Thanks for joining okay. me. Bye-bye. <laughs>